it's coming. Uh, I don't know about you, I enjoy, I, I, I love the change of seasons. Um, winter a little bit less than other seasons, but I do love the change from summer to fall. I hope that as we go into this new season, you are embracing the change and it's uh, refreshing to get outside. So I encourage you all to enjoy uh, what God is doing in the change of seasons here today. Before we begin our uh, chapel this morning, let me walk us through some things that are happening as part of our community. Uh, first off, we have uh, tomorrow, Wednesday at 11 a.m., our uh, continuing uh, the Upper Room series for Mosaic Fellowship. And we will be hearing from our very own Dr. T. Tianu, uh, his story. And uh, we do welcome you to come in Rodine 125. Uh, at 11 a.m., and there will be a light lunch provided as well. So more uh, incentive to be a part of that tomorrow at 11 a.m. Tomorrow as well, in the evening, we also have our revival prayer meeting, and that will be meeting right here at 7.30 p.m. So we encourage everyone to come together to pray for revival, not just here on campus at Trinity, but in, within our community and the world, and praying that God would continue to do the work in the hearts of both the lost and his own people. So we invite you to that tomorrow evening at 7.30. On Thursday at 11, we have a treat, a lecture by our very own Dr. Joshua Jip, and he will be speaking on uh, Paul, and the title of his message is Learning to Love, Loving to Learn, Going to Seminary with the Apostle Paul. So we encourage you to come out to that Thursday at 11. We, there is a link there, henrycenter.org slash events and we ask you to register if you can there will be snacks provided and it'll be a, a really engaging time of discussion uh, with Dr. Jep and with other respondents. We also want to let you know that we're doing a, some new things here on campus with regard to spiritual life and with prayer. Every Monday at 8 a.m. in the prayer room downstairs in the library we'll be hosting a mor Monday morning prayer. It's a great way for us to start our weeks it's a great way for us to begin our rhythm of spiritual life here on campus. So if you are available, if you are free, we do encourage you to come out to that. That is, again, in the library downstairs in the prayer room. If you need directions to that, uh, there will be people to help direct you. But every Monday morning from 8 to 8.30, we'll begin our week in prayer. And speaking of prayer, we do have an online prayer request form. If you do need prayer or would like the student life office and the chapel office to be praying for you personally. Uh, you have a chance to submit a prayer request anonymously or with a name uh, online to us, or you can email chapel at tiu.edu. But we do welcome you to share what your prayer needs are with us. We desire to pray for you. We want to know uh, how things are going with you. And if you need any help or support, prayer or otherwise, please do let us know. As we begin this morning... We're going to hear a call to worship from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, you, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Let's worship together this morning. Let's stand together this morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough. 
is enough. Your grace is enough for me. It is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Yeah, your grace is enough. Heaven reaching down to us. Your grace is enough. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides And this is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain That is a faith proved of more worth than gold so refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ So firm on His promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God is my victory and He is here all of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, I every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. 
all of my life in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship I will bring praise I will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and he is here I will bring praise I will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and he is here. Sing it out. This is my prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow. I know filled to be emptied again the seed I've received I will sow Amen. You can have a seat. Let's pray. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, majestic is your name. Your mercy and goodness crown the creation with glory. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, the one in whom we have our being, to whom our being belongs, and for whom our being hungers. Fragile and often disobedient creatures, we puff our chests with pride, taking credit for that which we have received from your generous hand while minimizing our sin against you. We forget you are Lord of hosts, holy God in our midst. Forgive us. Please lift our heads and set our eyes upon you. How is it, Lord, that you, with eyes too pure to look on sin, dwell amid an unholy people. Who is this God of glory, a redeemer willing to descend and enter the sin-torn creation for the sake of a sinful and rebellious people? Lover of life, you died a death of shame for the hope placed before you, a reconciled creation, a people who were not your people, a people made holy in themselves through your Son in the presence of the Spirit. From you, through you, and to you be all things. Thank you for the gift of yourself in Christ, in the Spirit. Ever-present God, hearer of our prayers, we ask that you might refresh and revive your people here and throughout your creation the single bride of the beloved. Expand our hearts that we might grow in affection for you and your world. Help us to discern what is precious in your sight and what will be moth-eaten. Show us how to sharpen and love one another in truth, boldness, and power, and also in humility, kindness, and grace. Help us to be faithful as you are faithful. Teach us what it means to be the people of God for the sake of the world, entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. You are the interceding God. Make us an interceding people. Increase our sensitivity to the Spirit. Make us obedient to his direction and grateful in co-laboring. Make us people who are willing to stand between, pleading for your condescending presence, O oh God, for the sake of people, place, pain, and also in rejoicing. And let that pleading rise, a sweet-smelling aroma, into the throne room of our ascended advocate. Eagerly we await your return, O oh High Priest. We come to this place to see you and praise you. Reveal yourself to us even now, 
for we seek your face and long to honor you with all of our being. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from Amos 5, 1 to 17. You have your Bibles under that, uh, your chairs if you want to. Sorry. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal, or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest her break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O oh, you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, he who made the Pleiades in the Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the night, the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and, uh, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing. In all the streets they shall say, alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your meads, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. As we continue in our series this fall uh, through the Minor Prophets, we are uh, overjoyed to welcome... Patrick Jones, our Director of Supervised Ministry, to share the word of the Lord for us from the prophet Amos. Patrick. Thank you, Jeff. Oop, not on yet. Getting there? Am I on? We're good. Thank you, Jeff. Very grateful to be here this morning. Excited to uh, be able to share the word with you and to listen uh, to the words that the prophet has spoken and continues to speak to us today. So when I was in high school, I used to spend a lot of time down the street at my friend's house. I'd go over, probably after school, we'd hang out. I was a nerd, so we read comic books, uh, we traded sports cards, uh, we would play video games, watch terrible movies, uh, probably watch movies that my parents would not allow us to watch at my house. And I'd usually stay until about dinner time or sometimes a little after dinner time and uh, begin to kind of work my way out the door. And on my way out the door, I would simply say, I'll see you tomorrow. And my friend's mom always replied, is that a promise or a threat? 
Oof. <laughs> Didn't know it was that hard to have me around. <laughs> but you know, we can be like that with the Lord as well. The Lord is coming. Is that a promise? Or is that a threat? We call out for Emmanuel, God with us. We long for his presence in our time of need. But he shows up, and we end up crying like Isaiah, Woe is me, I am ruined. Is the Lord's presence a promise or a threat? And the answer is clearly yes, it's both. But he's also our only hope. He brings a blessed hope to us. This morning, our text comes from Amos chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. And we'll see there that the Lord's presence is explored through these three angles. The presence of God as a threat. The presence of God as a promise. And the presence of God as our hope. So if you open with me to Amos 5, we hear what the Lord speaking us today. Now, if you're having trouble finding Amos, it's real easy. First, you flip to Obadiah. <laughs> it's a joke. It's not my only one. If you missed that one, I've got more later. All right. <laughs> and you turn one page to the left or right if you're using your BHS. Amos 5. Hear this word, O house of Israel. This lament I take up concerning you. Fallen is virgin Israel, never to rise again. Deserted in her own land with no one to lift her up. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The city that marches out a thousand strong for Israel will have only a hundred left. The town that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left. This is what we know about Amos. He's a shepherd from Tekoa, a small town in uh, Judah, just a little south of Jerusalem. So he's from the southern area, southern tribes. And uh, nothing like a good southerner stirring up trouble in the northern tribes. Am I right? Any southerners here can represent? All right, yes. All right, so he comes up and he's preaching to the north. He's preaching to the people of Israel, the northern tribes, and it, it, obviously then they were in the divided monarchy, probably around 765 to 760 BC, during Jeroboam II's reign. It's a pretty stable time. Jeroboam II reigns for 40-something years, 41 years, and things are looking good. You know, they've kind of recovered some of their territory. They're doing pretty well. The economy is doing fine. There's a little bit of trouble internally, but not too much to make anybody really concerned yet. And then this pesky little prophet turns up. This pesky little prophet, and the first things he says to them are a lament. I have a lament for you. Fallen is virgin Israel. Never to rise again. Deserted in her own land with no one left to lift her up. I brought with me this morning a mug. It's one of my favorite mugs. And this mug simply says, be careful or you will end up in my sermon. <laughs> I think Amos would like this mug. Because what he's doing here is he is calling out Israel. He's saying, you have not been careful. There are things that you need to attend to, and I'm going to say something about it. Amos sees that the nation of Israel is not actually in a good place. While the outside looks fine, the inside is in fact dying. And the reason is because the Lord is bringing his presence now, there's an interesting structural feature of Amos chapter 5. Uh, it's a chiasm, so that simply means, you know, that you start at the, the beginning and the, it has reflected at the end. So, verses 1 through 3, 
are again picked up in verses 16 through 17 theme-wise. And, you know, they work their way to the center, and we'll talk about the center in a minute. And I only really highlight that so we can see the chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, the idea of this fallen Israel is picked up again later in verses uh, 15, or 16 and 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God Almighty says. There will be wailing in the streets and cries of anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in the vineyards for I will pass through your midst. This is a funeral dirge. This is Amos saying, you're not just in trouble, you're dead. And you are dead for one reason and one reason only. And we get that piece at the very end there, 17. Why is Israel dead? Because the Lord is passing through their midst. This is very clearly a recall of Exodus chapters 11, verse 4, and 12, 12. Where the Lord says he will pass through Egypt. He will pass through Egypt. In the same way he's going to pass through Israel. Of course, in Exodus, for the people of God, he passes over them. But there's no promise of passing over here. He's going to walk right through them. How terrifying that reversal must have been for the people listening to Amos' message. We are the people of God. Surely it's okay. And yet Amos says, the Lord is going to pass through you and weeping and wailing will commence. I want to pause here for a moment. And I want to ask you, have any of you ever felt like the Lord was against you? Have any of you ever felt like instead of saying the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, you feel like the Lord is my enemy and I am so afraid. This room is filled with current and future pastors ministers, church leaders, influencers. All of you are going into ministry during an incredibly difficult time. It's incredibly difficult. The pressures right now on our clergy and in our churches is immense. And they only seem to be growing, escalating almost exponentially. In 2001... Barna released a study, and uh, the study was about pastors and kind of where they were at. And, you know, obviously we're in the middle of COVID at the 2021. And at that point in time, 29% of the respondents, 29% of these pastors had said that they had considered quitting full-time ministry in the past 12 months. Not just, I want you to hear this, not just changing jobs, not just leaving my church. They said, we want to quit full-time ministry. I've thought about it. It's been in my head. 29%, roughly a third. In 2022, that same study showed that 42% of pastors had considered quitting full-time ministry in the past year. 42%, a 13% increase in less than a year. Pastors gave many reasons. Here's a few of them. Uh, the, most people point to the top three, but I think it's just the, the few after that that actually begin to give us the full picture. So I'm going to give you a few of these. Pastors said they've considered the negative consequences of these things. The immense stress of the job. 56%. The immense stress. That's what they said. Feeling isolated and alone. 43%. Current 
Political division, 38%. A few more just after that sequence. So those are the high ones. Unhappy with the effect this role has had on my family, 29%. They're families. I'm not optimistic about the future of my church, 29%. My vision is at odds with the vision of the church, 29%. My church is steadily declining, 24%. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear this. Pray for your pastors. It is rough out there. And they need you and they need your support. Some of you feel this pressure yourselves. Some of you feel it as pastors and as leaders. Some of you feel it as students and you're thinking, gosh, the pressures of school, you're in seminary and you're trying to juggle work and family and ministry and school and it's just overwhelming. These pressures are real. And they can feel relentless. And I would speak personally here. I think when these pastors say, I feel the immense stress of this job. And that they're alone. And that their church is dividing over things that they have no control over. I think what some of them may be feeling, if, even if they're not saying it, is something like this. The hand of the Lord is crushing down on me. That their jobs as pastors is so closely connected to how they feel about God and their relationship with God. And maybe you feel that too. That when things aren't going right, they're trying to do the work of the Lord, but their church is struggling or dying or splitting. And you know what? They feel like it's all their fault. And God, don't you care about me and my church? He does. God cares about you. God cares about your churches. If you've ever felt that pressure... If you've ever felt that part where you feel like the hand of God is against you in your ministry or your life, I want to tell you a few things. First, I see you. And if any of you need to talk, I'm, I'm here. My office is just down the corner there. If you want to talk, and, and maybe I'm speaking just, a, just one person this morning, but if you need to talk about the weight of ministry or the weight of your preparation for that ministry. There are people who want to help you. I'm here for you. I know your faculty and staff members that you know are here for you, and we want to help you through this season. But I also have good news for you this morning. Because when the, the Lord feels like he's our enemy, if we're willing to listen, he says this, Verse 4, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. In case you miss it the first time, he says it again in verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. And if you miss it those times, he says it, Again, in verses 14 and 15, with a little slant. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. In verse 15, hate evil, love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant 
of Joseph. The truth is, sometimes we feel like the hand of the Lord is against us. And it's Satan lying about who you are and what you've done. Sometimes we feel like the hand of the Lord is against us and it's the world and all of its brokenness putting its weight on you and making you feel that brokenness as well. Sometimes we feel like the hand of the Lord is against us and it's, it's us and our own humanity and our own brokenness struggling with who the Lord is and what he means to do with us. But sometimes... And this is important. Sometimes it's simply the Lord trying to get our attention. If I had time, I would point you a little bit more to Amos 4 than I'm about to do. But Amos 4 really talks through this. The things, the, the extent of the things that the Lord will go through so that we pay attention to him. So that we turn to him in our time of need. See, in all of these cases, whether it's the enemy, whether it's the world, whether it's ourselves, or whether it's the Lord talking to us, the solution is the same. Seek me and live. Seek the Lord and live. This is the only way to move from the Lord's presence as a threat to the Lord's presence as a promise. Amos 5, 4, and six, 4 through 6. Seek me. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile. And Bethel will be reduced to nothing. There's an interesting thing that happens here in Amos 5, verse 4. It, 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 he says, the, the Lord offers an invitation, seek me and live. But he immediately goes into this secondary mode. Uh, you know, that's going to be how we get to the heart of the problem. But he immediately steps into this problem where as soon as he says, seek me and live, he says, don't go, don't go to Bethel or Gilgal or Bathsheba. Now, I think the things that are happening here is these are places where Israel has seen the hand of the Lord before. I do not necessarily think this is against those places as places themselves. I think what's happening here is here are places that have been important in Israel's past. Where he has spoken to them, where he has even said, I am with you. And so Israel's thinking, we want to get back and right with God. We're going to go to the place that we know God is. We're going to go to these locations. And we're going to sit there. And we all know this illustration, right? Uh, sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car. Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. Neither, by the way, does sitting in a seminary chapel. <laughs> right? That being in these places means very little if there's not something else going on there. If we want to claim the Lord's presence as a promise, this is what I think Amos is getting at, is that we are going to have to allow our hearts to be examined by the Lord. I get that from verses 14 and 15. You see the seeking of the Lord in verses 15. 4 and 6 is tied very closely to the seeking of good, not evil, in verse 14. And hating evil and loving good, in verse 16, 15. The Lord Almighty will be with us if we seek Him with our hearts, if we seek good, if we seek to do His will. The poet Ice Cube once put it this way. You better check yourself 
before you wreck yourself. I think that's kind of what Amos is asking Israel to do. He's saying, look, you think you're good with God before you go to those places where you think God is. You need a heart check. As we get closer to the heart of Amos 5, verses 7 and 10 through 13, and I'm just going to summarize them right now. But here's the thing. Amos is going to say, you need a heart check. Here's some things that are happening, Israel, that you need to check on. Here's some things that you need to, to ask the Lord to deal with before you come walking into his sanctuary like you belong there. They turned justice into bitterness. They had been turning righteousness, casting righteousness to the ground. They had been hating the one who speaks up in court. They had been despising the truth tellers. They had been trampling the poor. They had been building mansions, stone mansions. They had been oppressing the righteous. They had been taking bribes. They had been despising the poor of justice in the courts. Israel couldn't just walk into these shrines with their character in their current condition. The presence of the Lord was going to tear it apart. If they wanted the presence of the Lord to be a promise, something was going to happen. There was going to have to be a change. There was going to have to be a transformation. Leads me to my final point this morning. God's presence, if we want to move from threat to promise, that God's presence is actually our only hope. You see, what we tend to do in these situations is say, man, the Lord, that looks rough. I'm, I'm just going to walk away. Man, that situation doesn't look right. God, I don't want to deal with my heart right now. I think I'll just go over here for a little while. A little while. The very heart of Amos chapter 5, though, is this really interesting thing that happens. You can see it. The NIV doesn't even know what to do here, actually. Uh, but you can see it. Verse 7, you have a, an, a, a, an accusation. You turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. And the NIV here puts it in parentheses. And it goes all the way through verse 9. And in the parentheses is... is Amos turning to the Lord. He's saying, here's all the things that we're doing messed up. Here's all the places that I am as a person, that we are as a nation, and that it's messed up. And if we want to have the presence of the Lord as a promise, these things are going to have to change. How do I change? I don't know how to change. And Amos goes, it's very simple. You know what the very heart of this chiasm is? It's in verse 8, part B. The Lord is his name. That is the key for Amos. The Lord is his name. That is the heart of his message. It is the heart of the gospel of Amos. The Lord is his name. And if we look here at verses 8 and 9, we say, what does the Lord do? Who is this Lord and why is this his name? He says, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns blackness into dawn and darkness into night and calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. He flashes destruction on the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. You see, when we ask God about the transforming power, guess what? It cannot be us. I cannot change myself. I cannot change my spots. But you know who can? The Lord is his name. He's the one who put these constellations in the sky. And most people think that this is actually a talk about the change of seasons. These, these constellations show up at, at season changes. Fall turns into winter. Winter turns into spring, the changes that the Lord brings. But then look, of course, he turns blackness into dawn and darkness darkens the day into night. There's both a promise there, by the way. Yeah, and, you know, he, he makes that darkness and he makes it light. But you know what? He also dials it back. <laughs> he, he can bring it. 
He can bring the noise if he needs to. He can turn that day into night. See, if God is able to change these things, if he's able to change the constellations, the stars, and keep our planet moving, if he's able to change day into night and night into day, if he's able to gather the waters of the sea, pour them over the earth, and make us think about who he is, guess what? Guess what? He can change the situation you find yourself in. He can change that moment where you feel like the Lord's hand is against you because the world is falling apart around you. Guess what? The Lord's hand is strong enough for you. The Lord's hand enough is strong enough to lift you up. It is God himself. The Lord is his name who changes everything. He subverts and overturns and transforms the things that were once powerful into rubble. And if you feel like, God, I, I just feel like I'm so overwhelmed and you know, I, I just don't think that you even notice any of us. It's the Lord who obviously notices the fact that these, these have trampled the poor. They've trampled those who need it the most. The Lord sees them and he makes a promise. I will walk through. The Lord is his name. He is the only hope that we have of being transformed, of being renewed, of being resurrected. Nothing is beyond his power. So where does that leave us this morning? If we want the presence of the Lord to be a promise and not a threat, we will need to seek him alone. He called his people to have a relationship with him. Seek me first. Seek me and live. See, Amos proclaims the gospel. We were enemies of God. And he called us to seek him. Isn't that fascinating? The Lord tells us, seek me. Because he's always reaching first. He says, seek me and live. He alone can change us. See, we can walk right through this passage and nothing can change. But if we seek Lord, he changes everything. Now, I don't think the Apostle Paul was necessarily thinking of Amos chapter 5 when he wrote Romans chapter 5, but I sure did. This gospel is found, just as it is in Amos, in Romans 5, when Paul writes, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This morning, if you feel like the Lord has been your enemy, his hand has been against you, that you have been struggling mightily, and you just don't know where to turn to, the Lord is his name. Seek the Lord and live. He is. And change everything. Let's stand together one more time. 
This hymn text is one of the more rare hymn texts based in the passage from uh, the book of Amos. But it's a familiar tune, so let's sing it together. Let justice flow like streams of sparkling water pure, enabling growth, refreshing life, abundant cleansing show. Let's take that first again. Let justice flow like streams of sparkling water pure, Enabling growth, refreshing life, abundant cleansing show. Let righteousness roll on as others cares we heed. And ever flowing stream of faith translated in. So may God's plumb line stray, define our measure true, and justice right and peace pervade this world our whole life through. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this word from your your servant Amos and from Patrick, and we ask that as we go through the, the many different circumstances we endure in ministry and life, that you would be our hope, and that we would seek you and live. Receive this benediction from 1 Peter 5. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. And all God's people said, amen. We welcome you to fellowship in the back. And uh, we ask that you continue to keep these words and, and the things we hear in chapel in your thoughts throughout the day. Go in peace.